Ahead, we're gonna. We uh, don't have as many verses tonight. That doesn't mean that the content is lacking. It just means that we covered a good deal uh, of of what the confession says about this chapter. We are in the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith. It's a confession that many Reformed Baptist churches affiliate with and hold to doctrinally. I don't hold to every single point, and I told y'all when we began this months ago that when we come up on some things, I will tell you that, hey, this is, I'm not where they are on this, and not in a combative way. But uh, the London Baptist Confession is not our ultimate authority. It is drawn from the scriptures, which is our ultimate authority in the church. So Christ the mediator in paragraphs five and six, there are a total of 10 paragraphs in this chapter. And folks, I gotta tell you just from not even a pastoral uh, perspective, but as a, as a believer, this chapter is so rich on who Jesus is and what he has done, what he is, uh, what we are benefiting from even now because of what he has done. And this is a great, great chapter to help you to communicate to people that doubt who Jesus is or deny necessary aspects about Jesus. This is a chapter that can help you. Even, you know, you may make the points and they still don't believe them, but it's hard to refute these things. Uh, I've talked to people that are in cults to where, you know, that they will admit, well, I, I'm not really sure how to, how, to, how to respond to that. And it's not a gotcha kind of a thing, but it's, wow, that, that goes against what I've been taught. So um, it, it, we're not doing this so that we can have, you know, uh, victories doing apologetics, but we do need to know these things. So let's look at paragraph five. It's rather brief. The Lord Jesus has fully satisfied the justice of God. That word fully is important. Obtained reconciliation and purchased an everlasting inheritance in the kingdom of heaven for all those given to him by the Father. He has accomplished these things by his perfect obedience and sacrifice of himself, which he once for all offered up to God through the eternal spirit. I do want to make a, a note about that phrase, once for all, not from the confession, but from the book of Hebrews. When the writer of Hebrews speaks of Jesus making the one, uh, the sacrifice once for all, it is the tendency of some people to want to, to understand that once for all people, but that's not the wording that the writer uses. He's talking about chronology. His one time for all time sacrifice. And that is a big distinction. Uh, obviously, people um, in, in Armenian camps and Reformed camps disagree on the other, and uh, well, you know where I stand on that. But that is right from the Greek language. The, the phrase in Hebrews is not talking about once for all people, but it's once for all time. It's a different phrase if it's meaning once for all people. So, and, and we'll see that a little bit. But let me give some remarks on this opening paragraph. The justice of God had to be satisfied. God, because he is holy, cannot dismiss sin. God doesn't make sin just disappear. It had to be atoned for. Payment had to be made. And, and uh, don't buy into this ransom to Satan theory that some of the, I know Joyce Meyer held to that. I don't know if she still does. I mean, I'm going to listen to her anyway. But some of the, the, the charismatics believe that the, the debt had to be paid to Satan. No, God is the one who was sinned against. The debt was paid to God by God the Son. Sin must be atoned for. It doesn't just vanish. Only a sinless one can fully atone for the sins of others. That's why the Levitical priest could never do this to the degree that Jesus does it. Because they are sinners. Jesus is sinless. This again points to the necessity of Jesus as being God. Mere man cannot accomplish this. Whereas God and man were separated, Jesus, who is eternally God, becomes man in the incarnation and 
in what he accomplishes reconciles the repentant sinners to God and he does so by his own redemptive work salvation is never this God did his part and I did mine it is never that salvation is of the Lord and only of the Lord we cannot take any credit in that none well I repented and believed those are gifts otherwise you could boast and Paul says we can't boast only our only boast is Christ those whom benefit from Jesus's work are those whom the Father gives to the Son the Father is not obligated to give any to the Son but he chose but he chooses to give some to the Son Jesus did have to perfectly obey and satisfy every requirement given to him from the Father in doing so he was then able to give himself as the perfect and one time for all time sacrifice and this is ultimately the work of God in his triune nature God the Father is at work in this God the Son is at work in this and God the Holy Spirit is at work in this Jesus is the one who took on flesh but that doesn't mean that the Father and the Spirit had no part they did um, sometimes people don't like it and you've heard me say it on more than one occasion the idea that God would save some but not all and, and again I just I, I'm like a broken record why do you think God owed salvation to any adult to think that and some people think that well God was obligated you don't understand justice and holiness you don't because if you did, you wouldn't make any charge against God for not saving all. You would be saying, God, thank you that you save any at all. Once you behold God and his holiness, you don't argue with him. You marvel that he would pardon any sinner. It's an amazing thing. John 17, verse 2, I'll read that one. And I know that we have a fewer number tonight, but if you would, and I'm not going to be mean, but if you would, just kind of be ready and, and we'll all pitch in. John 17, 2, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. This is Jesus in the actual Lord's Prayer. Now, folks, the Lord's Prayer is not our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That's the model prayer for disciples. How do I know that? Because in the model prayer, Jesus is telling them, they, they ask him, teach us to pray. Well, one of the lines is, forgive us our debts, our sins. That's what he's talking about. Well, Jesus can't pray that because he doesn't have sin. So that's the model prayer. John 17 is the high priestly prayer of Jesus, the true Lord's prayer. And this is him. And Judas Iscariot has been dismissed because he was never a believer. And he's with his 11 apostles and they are hearing him pray this prayer. And he is speaking about the authority that he has been given from the Father over all flesh and to give eternal life to those whom the Father has given him to save. And there's an implication there. The Father did all to him. How about Hebrews 9.15? Jan. Therefore he is the mediator of the new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Since the death has occurred that redeems him from the transgressions under the first covenant. Yeah, this is Hebrews. And remember, the main or a real simple way to, to, to think about the theme of Hebrews, Jesus is greater. In this section, not only is the is he the greater covenant giver, he's the greater covenant. And he's the mediator of this new covenant that uh, is, is better than the old. And those who are called, who are they? Those whom the Father gives to the Son. Yes, uh, the word is the elect. It is, folks. I mean, that's who it's in reference to. Um, so that what? That they will receive what God has promised, the eternal inheritance. Because Jesus' death on their behalf is bringing redemption from their sins. But that had to happen. Jesus had to die in, to make payment. How about Hebrews 9.14, the verse before that one? 
Who might do that one? April? How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Okay, key phrase there. Now, the blood of Christ, he had to die. That's not just he bled. No, he, he died. The eternal spirit, the Holy Spirit is not a force from God. He is God the Holy Spirit. He's, he's a person. But Jesus offers himself. They didn't take his life. He gave it, and he did so without blemish. Why is that important? Because if Jesus had even one sin, then he is not a viable mediator. He cannot atone for anyone else's sins like only the Messiah can. That's why this, you can't play around with this. Well, you know, I believe Jesus was good, but I don't know if he was sinless. Well, if he's not sinless, then he's not Savior and he's not God. That's how big this is. And the writer of Hebrews talking about Jesus says, no, he's without blemish. And at another place in Hebrews, he didn't have any sin. That's all very, very important. I know that some in Mormonism uh, believe because there is a teaching now, I had a guy deny it one time, and maybe he just wasn't familiar with it, but within Mormon teaching, Jesus and Satan are spirit brothers, and don't get too much in an argument with them over that, because then you tend to just start getting nasty. But the belief is, is that Jesus is a man who sinned his way out of that, and as he was able to do that, so can you. Well, if he's a sinner, then he's not able to make full atonement. And he's not Savior. And all of that is huge. And Mormons will tell you that they are Christians. But in truth, they're not. They're not. Well, they go to church more than I do. Doesn't make them saved. Well, they're very faithful. Doesn't make them saved. They have wrong doctrine to, a, to an extreme degree. And it doesn't mean that everything they believe is wrong. But the essentials, yeah, they've missed that terribly. Hebrews 10, 14, for by a single offering, he, Jesus, has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Now, here's what's awesome about this. A single offering. Let's think back to the Old Testament, the Levitical priest, and there's one high priest. When he dies, the next one is ready to, to go in that place. Every September, roughly, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Not that they don't, they do sacrifices all the time. But on this one Day of Atonement, the high priest goes into the, to the tent of meeting, not much different than the size of our little sanctuary. And there's the veil that separates the inner sanctuary from the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies is that room where the Ark of the Covenant is and where the manifestation of God's presence is. No, God is not confined to a little room. But his presence is there, and he has to go behind that veil, and there's going to be blood placed upon the mercy seat. And all of this is fascinating reading back in Exodus and Leviticus. But he's a sinner. So he's got to make atonement for his own sins and then go on behalf of the people. Jesus doesn't have any sin of his own. So what happened every year? They had to repeat the process. Why? Because God did not institute the Levitical priesthood to be that which gave real salvation. But it was useful. It was, it was telling them something. There is coming, more than just today, there is a coming one, Genesis 3.15, who will give his life one time. And you're believing him. That's what they were really doing. They, if for those who were believers in the Old Testament, they were taking God at his word concerning the Messianic promise. That's what they were doing. But Jesus doesn't have to repeat the sacrifices. He gives his life one time and one time only. And this might seem like a, a small issue, but I have a real problem when Roman Catholics keep having their crucifix with Jesus on the cross and you say, well, it's just symbolic. But they, they believe in what this, this repeated sacrifice thing. No. His sacrifice one time for all time was perfectly sufficient. He doesn't have to die again and be raised again, die again. No, one time. And Hebrews makes that so clear. But if you're a Roman Catholic, you don't believe that Scripture alone is the ultimate authority. You believe it's Scripture and tradition, and you get really messed up. So by his one-time single offering, one-time for all-time offering, he has perfected those who are being sanctified. 
And we, we are being perfected and we will ultimately be perfected. We're just not there yet. At least I'm not. Anyone there? Okay. How about Romans 3, verses 25 and 26? Can I get a volunteer on that one? Anyone? Go ahead, Jan. Whom God put forward as an appropriation by his blood to be received by faith, this was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he has passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. All right. God has put forward as a, the word propitiation means a satisfactory sacrifice. In the Old Testament, the system of sacrifices, God was very specific on what you could offer. And do you remember in Malachi? Now this is post, you know, ag exile in Babylon. They've come back. The temple has been rebuilt. And God sends in the, the prophet Malachi because the people of the southern kingdom, they're in Jerusalem with a rebuilt temple. They're offering their lame and the blind. And God says, would you offer that to your governor? Well, no. I mean, if someone of importance were coming, we, we, we would give him the best. But for me, you, you give me your scraps? And not only that, you're disobeying my very specific laws? Jesus Christ didn't come in a flimsy manner and just kind of stroll through life and, hey, I'll go to the cross for you. Jesus came on a mission. And the cross was always in view. He faced real temptations in his humanity. And not one time did he ever succumb to those temptations. And on the cross, as the Father is pouring out his wrath on him, at the same time, he is able to say, this sacrifice is good. This sacrifice is pleasing. And it's the sacrifice like no other. Not the blood of bulls and goats, the writer of Hebrews says, but the blood of the spotless lamb of God, who is Jesus. Those who believe God, they take God at his word concerning this person. How were Adam and Eve saved? They took God at his word when he said, the day is coming when the seed of woman, my son, will come into the world. He will be bruised on the hill, but he will crush the serpent's head. Well, they didn't know that his name was Jesus. They didn't have to know that his name was Jesus. They knew that there was one who was coming. Abraham, well, he was saved because he was circumcised. No, he believed God two, over two decades before he was circumcised. He believed God and God reckoned his faith to him as righteousness. Faith in what? In God's promise concerning the Messiah. They were always looking ahead. We look back. The people in the Old Testament are saying that saved the same way people are saved today. It is by faith in him alone. The one who can bear my sin and atone for them and God be pleased with it. It's an awesome, awesome uh, understanding. Uh, when it says that God passed over sins, that doesn't mean he just kind of winked at them and went, oh, no, they have been sufficiently paid for. They have been dealt with appropriately, rightly, and fully. And they can never be thrown at you again in God's courtroom. And that shows his righteousness at the present time that, he's not, uh, that he might be the just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So how might you, how might I rightly respond if you heard someone accuse God of being bloodthirsty because he demands that sin be atoned for. And I've, I've heard this argument. Well, he's a monster. He just, he's out for blood. Okay, what, what's a good response? What do you think? Don't be afraid. He, he we'll, can do what he wants with what's his. Yeah, that, I, he's God. And he's never, gonna, he's never going to defy himself. He's never going to sin. 
But is he just, is he just bloodthirsty? Is he a monster? He's holy. Always get people to that place. One of the ways you can do that, and it doesn't always work because now sometimes they're not being honest. And sometimes people just, they, they're very inconsistent. But you can ask probably a lot of people, and I know this is an awful subject. You believe in, you believe in hell? No, no, okay. So you, you live, you die, yeah. What do you think about child molesters? Oh, they're evil. Well, what if, what if before they get arrested, they kill themselves? And you see it, they're just like, because what they've just told you is, well, they got away with it. Now they, they die, but we all die at some point. And you can just kind of see the wheels spinning of like, they got away with it. <laughs> I remember, I think it was a Ray Comfort. I don't know if you all know who Ray Comfort is, but he would go and do these interviews with people. And he asked this old man, this older man, um, do you believe in hell? No, no, I don't. That, that's, that's mythology. And then he was old enough to know that the Holocaust actually happened. He said, what do you think about e uh, uh, Adolf Hitler? He goes, he's evil. He's going to rot in hell. <laughs> he goes, no, wait, you, you said you don't believe in hell. He goes, well, for him I do. But what ends up happening is, uh, in the conversation was, so you realize that if there's not, if there's not a hell, and people get away with it, and the, and the guy was like, that's just not right. And so he goes into the holiness of God and why it's necessary to have hell and how we don't get away with it, but how none of us will get away with it. And our only hope is if one goes on our behalf and, and by the time this conversation is over, this man is in tears. I mean, when he's first approached, he's rugged. I mean, it's like, I don't, I don't want to do this. By the end of it, it's, it's like the reality is sinking in. There has to be a hell. Because there has to be a holy God. Sometimes you're going to encounter people that are just going to say what they've heard from others. Sometimes people really have thought through this and they're like, Daryl, I just can't imagine a loving God being bloodthirsty and making his son die on the cross. Char uh, Robert Shuler, remember that guy? Crystal Cathedral, Ugh. false teacher. That's cosmic child abuse. No, it's the gospel. Sin had to be atoned for. And it required the death of the Lamb of God who gave his life willingly. God is, I, and this is just a way to approach it. You, you say that God is bloodthirsty. I, I, I don't know, I don't think that's a right way of, of saying it. Does God require sacrifice and blood meaning death? Yes. Yes. Why? And he, he just opens up the door to tell him, here's why. How should these truths and these verses, more importantly, impact our affections toward the triune God? As sinners, what we've just read, and I think everyone in the world, what do these verses do for your soul about what Christ has done to make atonement for us? What does that do for you? Very thankful. I mean, <laughs> yeah. thank you. Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you, God. Us, you know. That's what it ought to do. Yeah. I don't feel like worshiping Jesus today. Oh, you don't feel like it? <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> it ought to draw us to the place of Lord God. Thank you. Nothing I face in this life, and people have faced some pretty awful things, nothing that I face in this life should be able to take the joy I have in you because you have pardoned me and you have given my life meaning. And when the day comes when my heart beats for the final time, I'm going to get to behold you not in fear, but in joy. But it's all because of you. Well, let's do paragraph six. 
The price of redemption was not actually paid by Christ till after his incarnation, yet the virtue, efficacy, and benefit of it was imparted to the elect in every age since the beginning of the world in and by those promises, types, and sacrifices that revealed him, that's talking about Messiah, and pointed to him as the seed that would bruise the serpent's head. There's that Genesis 3.15 reference. And the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, he is the same yesterday and today and forever. That's from Hebrews. We'll read that. First Corinthians, or let me give these, these comments. God saw before any of us were created those whom he would save. Paul in Ephesians 1 speaks of how God a predestined to adoption a people for himself and, and a friend of mine who does not think the same way I do theologically he told me he said I don't like predestination and election I said yes you do you have to because they're in the Bible because I don't I don't think the way you think on that I said yeah but don't don't say you don't like predestination and election because those are biblical words you you must like them because they're there and they're good <laughs> You might disagree with my understanding of them, but don't say, well, I don't like the words. They're good. And God knew before any of us were here whom he would save. He knew that. He knew that Satan would fall. He knew that man would fall. None of that took him by surprise. And that troubles some people, but I don't think with good reason. Understanding that God knew that people would sin and he still created them doesn't diminish his eternal goodness. Because God is eternally just. God is eternally holy. Therefore, no sinner can ever rightly accuse God of any wrongdoing. God is gracious in that he pardons any sinner, much less many sinners. From eternity, God has known those whom he would save. The Bible calls these people the elect, and it's not afraid to do so. Even if people don't like that language today, it doesn't matter. Paul used it. The Bible uses it. Peter uses it. Jesus speaks of the people whom the Father gives to him. And still, with all of the eternal knowledge, Jesus did have to enter into time and space, taking on human flesh in the incarnation to become a man so as to accomplish redemption for those whom he was sent to save. And he did every bit of that satisfactorily. So in one sense, God knew me before I was here, yet Christ still had to come and live as a real man and, and make the payment. But God knew that was going to happen. 1 Corinthians 4.10, we are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are held in honor, but we in disrepute. Paul talking to the very immature believers at Corinth. How about Hebrews 4.2? We've gone to Hebrews quite a bit tonight. Hebrews 4.2, who's got that? Anyone? Anyone? April. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. Okay, now understand something. Some people have the idea that if you're a Jew, you're saved. That is not true. Abraham was a Chaldean who God made into a nation and he became a Hebrew, later known as the Jews. So Adam and Eve, they weren't Jews. They weren't Gentile. They're just people. But then you have the people of Abraham and they're the the Hebrews, the Jewish people. But then you have those who are not of his line. They're the, the, uh, the Gentiles. The Hebrew word is goyim, the nations. There were Jews in the Old Testament who heard the same gospel that other Jews heard and they didn't believe it. And they perished. They are not with the Lord. And there are some people like, oh, no, 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 if you're Jewish. You're, you're, you're saved. No, not unless you repent and believe. When people talk about Korah, remember the rebellion of Korah where he opposed Moses and God judged him by opening up the ground and Korah and his people were swallowed by the earth? 
I don't think that was just a physical death. I think that was a spiritual death. They are not with the Lord. And they were Jews. No person is right with God because of ethnicity or because of birthright. You, you must repent of your sins and trust Christ to save you or you will not be with the Lord. And, um, I don't know if John Hagee still held, holds to that dual covenant stuff or not. I, it's awful. There are Jews who are in hell or they're in, they died in unbelief. I'll say it that way. And yes, I do believe that there's a real hell. There's just the argument of, is, is, is it now what it will be? And I'm not going to get into that tonight. That's just reality. And the writer of Hebrews is talking to Jews who have at least professed faith in Jesus as the Messiah, but now they're being pressured and tempted to go back to Judaism. And the writer is saying, don't do that. Hold fast to your confession. If you go back, then you'll prove that you never believed it and, and what you're going back to can't save you. So the good news came to us just like to that generation, but they heard the message and it didn't benefit them. They knew what God promised to Adam and Eve in the garden. They knew God's promise to Abraham. They were well versed in that and they didn't believe him. What do you see repeatedly in the 40 years, technically 38 years of wilderness wanderings? They don't believe it. An entire generation dies. He says, you will not see the promised land. I think those people died in unbelief, not just physical death. Why? Because they were not united by faith with those who listened. I hear what you're saying. The gospel is very clear. I don't believe it. That's, that's the, the picture here. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, Peter says, Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully. By the way, Peter is writing to Gentiles. There's some people that think he's writing to Jews. No, no, he's writing to Gentiles. Verse 11, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. God raised up prophets to tell you this way before the time. When Jesus, post-resurrection, meets up with the two people traveling to Emmaus, and he just strolls upon them, and they don't, they, they don't know it's him. They've heard that he's raised, but they don't know it's him, and he's walking with them. And they're like, have you not heard what happened to Jesus? And it's him. And then he rebukes them gently. You're so slow of heart. Don't you believe everything that the prophets said? And it says, from Moses and the prophets, that simply means the scriptures, the Old Testament. He explained how all that was written was pointing to him. So when you read Exodus, it is ultimately pointing to Jesus. When you read Nahum, it is ultimately pointing to Jesus. When you read 2 Kings, it is ultimately pointing to Jesus. Peter is making that clear. God raised up prophet after prophet to point us to Jesus. And now I've seen him, touched him, and heard him, and I'm telling you about him. Just a couple of more. How about Revelation 13, 8? And yes, it's Revelation singular. <laughs> Who would read that one? Anyone? Any volunteers? Uh, Miss Peggy, thank you. And I will dwell on earth and worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life the lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world um, or, or everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world Jesus okay no he wasn't slain from the foundation but but he, he would he knew that that was going to happen but before the foundation of the world there there was a recording of those who God would save before Adam was created God knew that and I know people that that, that bothers them. And let me tell you why it usually bothers them. What about those who aren't written in the book? And I get it. It's distressing. But then I keep coming back to the reality. Well, are you going to spend more time getting mad because of those who weren't written in the book? Or are you going to be glad that there were some who were? Very weak illustration. Building on our conversation, this is not to be terrifying with the trip that your daughters take. Let's say we're on the Titanic. 
and it's sinking. And there are more people than there is space on the lifeboats. And I'm not going to get on that lifeboat. And I'm huffing and I'm puffing. What are you mad about? There's going to be people saved. What? Yeah, I'm going to die. And I think we should all die. That's, that's like the attitude of some people. Well, if he's not going to save all, then he shouldn't save any. I'm like, no. Rejoice that he would save any. Don't get mad at him that he doesn't save all. Well, what if your mamma or what if your papa or your uncle or your brother, your, what, if, what if they weren't saved? I've got relatives that I'm pretty sure died lost. And I don't say that lightly. But that doesn't make me question God's goodness. You don't get mad at God in that he doesn't write everyone's name in the book. You thank God that he would write any name in the book. And like that little illustration I just gave, that is weak. That really is kind of the attitude. It's almost like, well, if, he, if we can't all get off this ship, then none of us should. And you're thinking, but nobody would say that. Yet people argue that way when it comes to God having a people for himself. There will never be a moment when a person who has died in unbelief will be able to look at God and say, you are unjust. None. None. Because every single one of us deserve the wrath of God. Luke 16, where Jesus the story and there's a debate was that a real story is it a parable only I'm not going there the rich man and Lazarus not the same Lazarus from the book of John the rich man dies and is separated from the Lord in, in his unbelief Lazarus dies and he goes to Abraham's bosom and there's this conversation between Abraham and, and the rich man and he he says just send Lazarus over to dip his finger in water and touch my tongue you no know? There's a chasm. can't happen. And then the rich man says, well, send, send someone from the dead to my brothers so that they don't end up here. Notice the attitude there. He's not saying, God is unjust for putting me here. He says, please send someone to others so that they don't end up here. Notice the difference? He's not arguing about why am I here and this isn't right. Please get word to my brothers. And this is Abraham's response. They have Moses and the prophets. In other words, they have God's word revealed. If they don't believe that, then they won't believe someone who comes back from the dead. So when people say, well, if, I, if this happened, I would believe God, that's an arrogant statement. And I backed that up biblically. That man in Luke 16 is not arguing about the unjustness of him being in hell. He is saying, please send word to others that they don't end up here. That's the right attitude. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. He's eternal. He is the same. So why do people, knowing that their insights, catch this, knowing that their insights and their knowledge is limited, think that they are justified in questioning God regarding those whom he saves and those whom he does not save? Why do they feel justified when they do that? Any ideas? <laughs> They're speaking in ignorance. Well, I just can't imagine. That's not an authoritative, that's not an authority. That's your imagination. And I'm not being a jerk there. I just don't like this. I just don't like this. Just because you can't figure it out doesn't mean it isn't true, and it certainly doesn't mean that it's not good. When Paul wrote to the Romans, and he says there in chapter 9, that God can show mercy to whom he wants to show mercy to, and he can raise up people to show his wrath, Paul anticipates that some of those believers were going to say, oh, no, 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 I don't like that. That does not make sense. Paul assumes that. How do I know? Because then he immediately follows it up with, and who are you, O oh man, who says to God? In other words, you want to say that God is not just? 
be real careful there. And he assumes that there are going to be some, well, that was exactly what I was going to say. And Paul is trying to do something, not to get into a theological fight, but to say, take a breath, take a look at holy God, and don't ever accuse him of being unjust. God didn't have to pardon any sinner. He has pardoned some. Rejoice. Don't get mad about it. You say, well, Darrell, that's easy for you because your theological position. Friend, I'm not telling you that I came to it easy, but it makes so much sense. Now, in the things that I don't understand, and there are plenty of things that I don't understand, that's where I have my questions. Well, no, 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 no. Lord, I don't know what I don't know. But I know that you're good and you know everything and that has to be enough because you don't have to explain your ways to me. You don't have to do that. I always go back to the book of Job when Job said, I'm going to ask questions and he's going to answer me. And by the time God gets done with Job, Job is not saying that anymore. He's like, I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to listen. You say what you say and that's all I need. How should believers respond when they consider that God knew that they would sin against him and yet he saw their salvation before the world was made? It's going to be very similar to Jan's answer from the first set of questions. How should we respond to the fact that God knew that we would sin, but he also knew who he would save? What, that ought to, what, what should that do for us? Say it. What should it lead us to do? It's a W word, and it rhymes with worship. 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 Question? Nope. Argue? Nope. God, I don't know what I don't know. And I admit to you that not everything makes sense to me. But it makes sense to you. Your ways are higher than my ways. That's right from your book. You, you never say oops. You, you don't make a misstep. You are absolutely holy. And that even if we're only one sinner that you saved, none of the rest could argue against you. So I'm not going to argue against you. I'm going to admit there are things I don't know, things I'm not really settled on, some things I have some real questions on. But it is enough that you know what you're doing. And you have made it clear in your word that you have pardoned me and I don't deserve it. I'm going to respond in worship. It hurts when people die lost and I'm fairly certain that this person died lost or that person. Yes, that hurts my soul. But that's not going to keep me from giving you the worship that you're due. That's the attitude. Does that make sense? All right, anything else tonight? All right, I'm going to get Stephen, if you would, to hit that not-so-magic button. Stop the recording where we reach tens of people through YouTube. All right.